Five years ago, Resident Evil was revolutionized. Everything we knew about the series was turned on its head with Resident Evil 7. Sure, there were familiar puzzles and items, but it was a watershed moment for the franchise. If you've played through it, I can't imagine you'll ever forget your time with the Baker family. I know I won't. That's right you won't. You call your channel Framework, but you ain't never built nothing substantial in your life. You got nothing on the genius of me, Lucas Baker. Well, it's true that I've never turned a barn into a madhouse that resembles one of Jigsaw's puzzles from Saw, but I have played a lot of Resident Evil, and 7 is one of the best ever made. Let's talk about why. I hope you're ready to meet the rest of the Bakers. Welcome to the family, son. Resident Evil 7 is a scary game, and that is absolutely deliberate. You see, the franchise has gone through a bit of a repeating cycle in its design. If we look at the numbered games as trilogies, we can map that out. Resident Evil 1 and 4 established something new and exciting. For the first game in 1996, it was the start of a golden era of survival horror games. Resident Evil 4 took the action to an over-the-shoulder POV in 2005, which changed the way you walked around and fought the members of the Las Plagas cult. Resident Evil 2 and 5 built off of those respective ideas while taking things to a slightly more action-packed place, before 3 and 6 started to jump the shark with a bit too much action. And so, it was decided that Resident Evil 7 would go back to its roots. In an interview with Forbes just after the game launched, director Koshi Nakanishi said that, quote, Horror is an absolute necessity in the core experience of Resident Evil. I think the more personal horror becomes, the scarier it becomes. What could be more personal than shifting the game into first person? The door opening animation from the original games was technically in first person, but that's not the same as what we experience here. This new POV lets the characters and monsters and all sorts of horrifying things get right up in your face. You mean like this? <laughs> so you're gonna talk about the past all day, Mr. Framework? Or are you gonna give me my time in the spotlight? We'll get to you soon enough, Lucas. Capcom brought us a new perspective, quite literally, with Resident Evil 7, but it wasn't such a shift that fans of the earlier games would miss out on familiar elements. In my Symphony of the Night video, I talked about how Konami took a strict platforming series and turned it into one half of the basis of the Metroidvania genre. Resident Evil 7 isn't so drastic, it's still survival horror like the rest of the numbered games, but it did use callbacks and staples of the series to help introduce us to a whole new style. There are some obvious things like a big house to explore, Spencer Mansion in the original game and the Baker Estate in 7. You start with a knife, you use key cards, you deal with a trap if you want the shotgun. Then there are shared elements that aren't so surface level. Both of those big houses share main halls with twin staircases. Both Resident Evil 2 and 4 kill off cops early on, and so does 7. I could go on, but suffice it to say that these callbacks and shared ideas remind us that while things might look and feel different, this is still very much Resident Evil. <sighs> TikTok YouTube man, my patience is not infinite. Okay, okay, let's start with, uh, well, the start. When Ethan Winters arrives at the Baker Estate in search of his missing wife Mia, he soon finds a VHS tape from the TV show Sewer Gators. It's not the first time I've talked about VHS tapes on this channel, but the ones here couldn't be more different from the ones in Crash 4. These let us experience events that took place here on the Baker's property before Ethan's arrival, like the filming of a low-budget ghost hunting show. A lot of bad rumors about their son, Lucas. Bad seat, apparently. You don't know me, but I do like being mentioned. These tapes don't just give us more backstory. They also teach us how to move forward in the main game. The Sewer Gators episode reveals how to open the secret passage in the guest house. The Mia tape shows us where to find half of the flamethrower. 
The birthday tape picks up with the same character we played in the Sewer Gators video, but now in one of Lucas's elaborate traps. And learning the solution there can help us escape from the same room more quickly when Ethan finds himself locked inside. The fourth and final tape is a peek inside Mia's past on the Annabelle before it wrecked. We'll talk more about the boat later. For now, let's focus on what these VHS tapes do for us as players. We get flashbacks, we get hints, and we understand where charred corpses like old Crispy Clancy here came from. All of those things were provided to us in previous games, but with handwritten notes and journal entries. The classic Itchy Tasty from the first game walks us through the mental decay of turning into a zombie. Here, the birthday tape lets us experience Clancy's fiery death firsthand. Of course, Resident Evil 7 still has those notes and environmental clues too. Jack's marine photo in the master bedroom implies where his natural strength came from before the mold mutated him further. His journal writings talk about the aforementioned boat that he checked out, and notes from his wife Marguerite mention the strange girl and woman that he brought back from the wreckage. We can even learn about Lucas's early engineering experiments from his childhood diary. Hey, that's private. Didn't anyone ever teach you to mind your own business? Resident Evil 1 has its own tragic family, of course. The poor Trevors were the original test subjects for Umbrella. With the exception of hunchback daughter Lisa Trevor, we never get to meet any of them, and we certainly don't get to see them in the flesh before said flesh was rotted by the progenitor virus. Conversely, we do see a healthy, uncorrupted Jack just before the ending of 7. The game pushed notes further by complementing them with moments like this and fully playable VHS tapes, and both help us understand the Baker family more deeply. After all, they are the centerpiece of the game. It doesn't take long for Ethan to find himself strapped into a chair for a truly stomach-turning meal, Texas Chainsaw Massacre style. It's here we meet most of the Baker family face-to-face, -face, thanks to the first-person perspective, and their strong personalities shine as we encounter them at other points around the property. We're hunted down by a stern, punishing father with Jack, we tangle with a caretaker who's not quite right in the head when we encounter Marguerite, we find ourselves dealing with tricks and traps designed by Lucas the Tinkerer, and we stumble upon Grandma being all creepy in random spots all over the house. But it all starts with that disgusting dinner scene. <laughs> you know, the hand thing is easy enough to fix, but it still smarts. After that, you'll spend much of the game running and hiding from the Bakers, who were generally unkillable thanks to the mold, but also pretty much mechanically invincible until the time comes for you to fight them in a boss battle. Jack and Marguerite specifically harken back to stalkers like Mr. X in Resident Evil 2 or Nemesis in 3, lumbering monsters that hunt you down across the map. Jack even evolves into different forms like Nemesis until he's finally defeated with the serum. <laughs> Resident Evil 7 takes these chases further. 2 and 3 force you to simply run away or juke around the big guys. There isn't much else you can do unless you want to dump a ton of ammo into them. But thanks to 7's first person view, we now get the option of hiding. Your best bet is usually to duck behind cover and let Jack or Marguerite pass by. You can peek to see that they've left the room before making a beeline out of there. First person also amps up the fights you eventually have with them. Imagine trying to run over Jack with a car using old school tank controls, or even a third person view behind and above the trunk. It wouldn't have the same effect at all, especially when he climbs inside and takes over the steering wheel. The same goes for the first Marguerite battle in the pit inside the old house. The closest equivalent I can think of would be tangling with the two Chainsaw Sisters in Resident Evil 4, since they also show up around a pit. And speaking of chainsaws, how about that sick duel with Jack in the basement? Those weapons are a whole lot scarier when the revving blades and flying sparks are right in front of your face. We can take this idea all the way to the final boss fight with Evelyn, as you fire into her monstrous face while being lifted off the ground by her black tentacles. Chris and Jill were grappled by Plant 42 in Resident Evil 1, and Leon can be grabbed by El Gigante in 4, but again, it's just not the same thing. 
First person fights in 7 let us experience these dynamic, cinematic moments without relying on quick time events or a fixed camera angle. I never did get my monster moment. It's cause my power is in my big old brain. Between the Baker family backstory and boss battles, Resident Evil 7 pushed its storytelling and combat mechanics further, but with other design choices, it actually changed things up by pulling back. And I'm talking specifically about the molded. You first encounter these monsters as you make your way to and through the basement. There's a handful of them down there, and for the most part, a handful is all you'll ever encounter. There are way, way less molded to deal with than the zombies you fight in other Resident Evil games. I mean, hello, Resident Evil 4's big village opening? There's nothing wrong with that, of course, and 4 is actually still my favorite of the series, but moments like that show a stark contrast with 7. Having fewer molded means they can be more dangerous. The dark, shambling monsters have large claws and other protrusions to attack you with. They remind me of a slower-paced Venom. That's my favorite comic book character. Him and Carnage. Having fewer enemies overall makes the encounters more intimidating, and it gives Capcom an excuse to deprive you of ammo even further. We still get a decent variety though, from the creepy crawlers to the bloated ones that spray puke from afar. And the bugs in the old house are a perfect complement to Marguerite's whole design. Like the boss battles, combat is improved by the first person perspective. Those bugs can buzz around your head in a much more threatening manner than any insect from earlier games. The molded can blend into the rotting architecture of the house and pop out only when you get close. But generally speaking, there's less combat here. It's totally okay for games like 4 to have a lot, just as it's necessary for 7 to pull back on it to achieve its more personal horror aesthetic. Another key part of that aesthetic? Puzzles. Whether it's winding clocks or placing objects or matching paintings, puzzles are a big part of Resident Evil's DNA, a part that simply had to stay for this game, even with its different take on horror. Special keys for ornate doors are a major part of that. If you want to thoroughly explore the Baker estate, you'll need to find the scorpion, crow, and snake keys. Longtime fans were probably instantly reminded of the heart, spade, diamond, and club keys from Resident Evil 2. When Leon later returned for 4, he had to collect pieces of a chimera carving to open a door in Salazar's castle, which is very similar to the Cerberus door in 7. Thing is, I actually did try to breed a three-headed dog once. He, uh, he didn't make it. Previous Resident Evil games already shifted into something of a first-person view for some of their puzzles. It just makes it easier to see what you're working with. But by staying in that established POV in 7, we never break our immersion. It also gives the developers way more nooks and crannies where they can hide items, which is one reason why the game gives us psychostimulants to find them all. In the same way that a magic trick is so much more impressive when done close up, Resident Evil 7's item hunting and puzzle solving means so much more when we can really stop and scrutinize the whole device. You get the sense that you really are manipulating these objects, whether it's to search for a hidden switch or turning a weird wooden carving to cast a shadow. Who builds this shit? I did, you jerk. Now, there's another major trend with Resident Evil games that I feel gets overlooked the protagonist Switch. I didn't realize this until revisiting the series for my earlier video on blood types, but the majority of the numbered games spend at least some time putting you in control of a totally different character. Rebecca Chambers takes over for Chris in Resident Evil 1 when Plant 42 grabs him, Sherry Birkin and Ada Wong step in during the split story of 2, Carlos takes it upon himself to get a vaccine for Jill in 3, and Ashley sneaks through the castle in 4, Resident Evil Zero featured a split between two characters, five focused on co-op, and six of course had multiple campaigns, but the protagonist switch returned with seven. Remember the boat that's been mentioned a few times now? You get there after choosing to save Mia, or Zoe if you're a monster, and once you arrive, Ethan is immediately snatched up by the mold. From here, it's up to Mia to save him, and her chapter starts ramping up the action toward the finale you'll face many more molded on the Annabelle than you did in the Baker House, 
It serves as a warm-up for the bigger groups of enemies that appear in the salt mines just before the climax. <gasps> Not only does this return to the pattern of earlier games, but it also serves a storytelling purpose. This boat is where Mia worked before the events of the game, taking care of little girl slash bioweapon slash secret grandma, Evelyn. In flashing back to the events that led to the shipwreck, we get to see Mia record the very video message that opens the game. This shipwreck eventually led to the moldy infection of the bakers, making this chapter wrap around to the start of the whole nightmare. It's fitting that the game already loops back on itself with VHS tapes, because the events on the boat are the ultimate dovetail for the story. You know, I have wondered where we got this gift. I should thank Evelyn again for bringing that boat to us. This dovetailing leads me to another discovery that could only be made in games that came after Resident Evil 7. If you want proof that it revolutionized the series, just look at how its changes carried over into other games. When the remakes of 2 and 3 came along, they copied 7's inventory management screen, D-pad weapon select, crosshair animation, and more. It retroactively made the previous games better by having its quality of life changes implemented in the remakes. Some people, including myself, would say that those are the definitive ways to play those games now. Furthermore, the changes are felt in Resident Evil Village. Instead of the Baker family, we get a whole team of charismatic villains under the direction of Mother Miranda. We see the same protagonist switch when Chris Redfield takes over toward the finale, and his chapter epitomizes the action that dominates that game. Perhaps we'll see more of an even balance between those guns blazing moments and the quiet homespun horror of Resident Evil 7 whenever 9 comes out. I hope they let me out for that one been under house arrest since Redfield got me in that DLC. Speaking of houses, I think I can sum up Resident Evil 7's revolution in one word. Homecoming. Sure, that's the name of a game from the rival Silent Hill franchise, but it feels appropriate here. Koshi Nakanishi's mention of personal horror falls right in line. The first person perspective is the most obvious change up, and it serves to bring us much more intricate puzzle solving and intense combat even if the fights happen less frequently. Those familiar elements are present, but modified. Notes can still be found, but they combine with the new VHS tapes to give us a more complete picture of the Baker family, the central figures of the game. We get the common protagonist switch, but it does more than just change up the pacing. It also shows us the harrowing events that preceded the Baker's tragic transformation. These changes not only made Resident Evil 7 feel special, but they revolutionized the remakes of earlier games and resonated throughout Village. I can only hope that its ideas about personal horror continue to influence the franchise from here on out. Steven, please help! Steven, help! No! No! <laughs> hey, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what Framework is doing, definitely hit that subscribe button in the middle. It would help me out an awful lot if you do. And if you want to see what we've already cooked up, you can hit that link on the far left. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.